Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let us hear what God, the Lord, will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Restore us again, O God of our salvation. Let us worship God. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, you have invited us into this story of what you are up to in the world. This gospel history, this good news for all humanity. Just as you have invited us, we invite you into our hearts, into our minds. We ask that you grant peace and stillness to all that would distract us. Turn our hearts toward you alone, for we are here to worship. We ask your forgiveness and pray that you restore righteousness to us, even as we approach your throne in worship. For we pray it all in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen, and we do welcome you to the virtual worship of the First Presbyterian Church of Hamilton Square. I'm Pastor Doug Cornelius. We are all glad that you joined us today. I'm also joined this morning by our music director, Julie Cottle, and as always, thankful to Bob Fisher for getting these videos out there onto the internet uh, so that we can all worship together 
virtually in this way. Just a couple announcements as we begin worship. Uh, The first is that we are uh, meeting in person at 10 o'clock a.m. on Sunday mornings, and that will be the case for the rest of the summer. So uh, if you are in town and feel comfortable, we invite you to come on by and worship with us in person. Also, we have uh, beautiful flower arrangements given this morning, uh, one in memory of Don Hawes, Jim Hawes' father, uh, by the Hawes family, and we honor his memory with you, and the other given in loving memory of Wayne Anderson on what would have been Wayne's 98th birthday this week, and those flowers were given, of course, by Barbara. And so we remember these folks with you and honor them with you. We thank you for uh, the beautiful arrangements to uh, brighten our chancel area. Well, as we continue in our worship this morning, I'm going to invite the children to gather around the screen. I have something over here that I know you're going to recognize. What's this right here? This is taken from one of our Sunday school classrooms, and if you're one of our older kids, you might even recognize it as having been in your Sunday school classroom. These are the Ten Commandments, aren't they? Oh, we've, we've probably learned about them since we are very young children, written on stone, brought down by Moses from the mountaintop. It's quite an exciting story. But, you know, sometimes we sit back and we look at these and we go, boy, that's a lot of rules. Ten rules, all on the same stone there. That's a lot. I mean, you know, a lot to remember. And sometimes I think, whether we're kids or we're adults, we can think that God makes a lot of rules. There's a lot of stuff for us to remember, a lot of, a lot of things for us to try and do. God asked a lot of us commands us to do an awful lot. And sometimes that is true. It feels true because it is true. But something I wanted to share with you this morning is this. Do you know what command God gives us more than any other? What the most important rule is in the whole Bible? Because God says it all the time, over and over again. Do you know? The thing that God says to us most is, don't be afraid. Did you know that? Don't be afraid. That's what God wants for us most of all. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever been afraid? Some of us are afraid of the dark. Some of us uh, were afraid that we might not pass that test at school. Some of us are afraid of of friends and that sort of thing, you know, if there's a bully at school or something like that, we might feel fear. Sometimes we get afraid because someone we love, a member of our family or maybe our pet, gets some bad news from the doctor, right? There's lots of reasons to be afraid, but to all these, God says, well, it's okay, it's it's normal to be afraid, but you don't need to be too afraid because I'm with you. We never have to be afraid that we're in it alone, because God is always with us. So we don't need to be too afraid. Well, that's a rule that I love to follow and try and follow it every day. And I hope this week you'll try and follow it too. Would you pray with me? Thank you, God, for telling us not to be afraid today, for guiding us in every way, Teach us to care and not to fuss because we know that you love us. Amen. Amen. I hope this week you won't be afraid and you'll know that God is with you in all things. And I'll see you next week. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6. This is a strange story in the Gospel narrative, one that you may not have heard preached on very often. This is the beheading of John the Baptist. 
I'm going to be reading it, and uh, there's a lot of he's and him's and hers and that sort of thing, so I might fill in some names for those pronouns so that we all are clear who we're talking about in the story. Uh, but otherwise, I'll be following the NRSV text as we do each week. This is the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, beginning with verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, Herod's brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married Herodias. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill John. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that John was a righteous and holy man, and Herod protected him. When Herod heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to John. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. Well, she went out and said to her mother, also Herodias, What should I ask for? Her mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Well, immediately, she, the daughter, rushed back into the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Well, the king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took John's body and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I invite you to please pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some folks have told me over the years that they look forward to church on Sunday for a lot of different reasons. We all have our reasons, don't we? For some, the, the music is what brings us into a space, a place of worship in our lives, and what draws us back to church and those pews time and time again. For others, there is something sacred about the sanctuary itself, just being in this space seems to place them before God in a way that they just cannot find elsewhere. Some folks come for the fellowship to see church family and friends and reconnect with this wonderful community. For some, it's communion or the healing rites or other prayers. The list goes on and on. We all have something that draws us into worship. And then there are some folks who say, I come for the pick-me-up. My week is difficult and boring, and Sunday morning just lifts my spirits. I need that rhythm. I need that mountaintop peak in my weekly calendar, that experience of being refreshed and energized, lifted up. And to those folks I say, well, here's a text about a beheading. 
You're welcome. Yeah, no pick-me-up for you this week. Not for you. Oh, what a strange text. Tucked away here in Mark chapter 6. And stranger still to be included in our lectionary. For this is the lectionary text for this morning. I mean, the lectionary hits the highlights of Scripture, giving a a nice full picture of the most meaningful and salient texts for the life of the church. It sort of functions like a greatest hits album for a band, if a band had a whole lot of hits. But here, hidden away on a Sunday in mid-July when everyone's on vacation, well, not me, but maybe you are and you're joining us virtually, tucked away in mid-July is this text about Herod beheading John the Baptist. And then the grisly details about John's head being put on a platter and passed around. It's all very Game of Thrones, isn't it? From the king marrying his brother's wife on down to a naysayer losing his life and his head. It's a strange text. Though there are more texts like it in the Bible than we might imagine. But it's definitely not a pick-me-up. It's sort of a bummer because John was so important to the story thus far. And perhaps that's the first thing to draw out of a text like this, this morning. First thing to draw out is that the stakes are high. Have you ever watched a show or a movie or read a book and the main character, the hero, is in some terrible circumstance? some really bad bind, and it really doesn't seem like they're going to make it out alive, and then you have that moment in your head where you go, they'll be fine. They can't kill off this character right now. Have you ever had that? They can't kill off the main character. They can't get rid of this person. There's a whole show left to go. They'll be fine. Have you done that? Of course, like 99% of the time when you say that, you're right. The show or the movie or the book, they can't get rid of that character. It would be too devastating. Harry Potter gets in some really bad predicaments in book four of the series, but if we know this series is going seven books, we can be pretty sure that Harry isn't going to die in book four. And we're usually right. And then there's always that movie or book that just goes ahead and does it kills off the main characters. And you're shocked. You can't believe it. It's it's like it raises the stakes all of a sudden for everything that comes after. Because if this person could go, then no one is safe. This is the sort of turn that the Gospel story takes when John gets beheaded. The stakes are now raised. No one is safe. A blow to the community that followed Jesus. A blow to Jesus himself losing his cousin. And it means for us as readers, no one is safe. John is the one that recognizes the Messiah even from in the womb. John prepares the way for Jesus' public ministry, preaching in the desert, Telling of the one who would come after. John gave up everything for the Messiah. Absolutely everything. He sold out completely for the Gospel. And like that, he's dead. He's gone. And we didn't see that coming. The stakes are high in this story. There's a cost for following this man Jesus. For standing for righteousness and truth. And the Gospel accounts are letting us know right up front here in chapter 6, and rather boldly, by reporting this news about John. John the Baptist is dead. Not just dead, but killed in an undignified way. And almost mocked posthumously with the treatment of his remains. And if John's not safe, well, maybe no one is. See, I told you, this is a real pick-me-up. I promised. But also an essential part of the story. 
Because now you know this is a story where the main characters could be lost. Where everything doesn't go exactly like you thought it would. The good guys don't always win and anything could happen. And so later when Jesus, Jesus Himself, ends up on a cross, talk about undignified, and then He breathes His last, you think, wow, it happened again. It really happened. The main character really died. And of course, he really did. Of course, there was one more twist in that plot yet to come. But this last thought that I shared leads us to our second takeaway for this morning. One less about how this functions in the broad scope of the story, and more of something we can take away and apply to our lives. I've always been struck by how arbitrary this seems, this death of John the Baptist. Herod thinks John is a righteous man. And so even though John is rebuking the king for making the decision to take his sister-in-law as his own wife, Herod spares John. He lets John have his say, have his word. But Herod's wife, who used to be his brother's wife, of course, Herod's wife is not happy with John. And when her daughter dances in a way that pleases all the powerful men gathered, Herod writes a blank check to her. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Well, there may have been some wine involved in this story, too. But now Herod has made an offer in front of his guests, so he can't back out. That would be dishonorable. So the daughter goes to her mother, Herod's wife, who used to be Philip's wife, and says, what should I ask for? And you know that old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned? Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but if you were trying to make a case for it, Herodias is exhibit A. This woman could have had anything. She could have asked for half of Herod's kingdom and instead asks for the head of John the Baptist. It's crazy. She's angry. She's holding a grudge. And it all, in the end, feels so arbitrary. A young daughter dances for probably a drunken king and his guests And he makes some big promise, and suddenly John the Baptist is dead because of a dance and a grudge. It's bizarre. It's arbitrary. And it actually feels like the most relatable part of this whole story. In this fantastical little piece of history with women dancing in the courts of kings and kings commanding off with his head, it can feel a little removed from our experience as 21st century American Christians. It feels like it's a lifetime away, a world away. It feels foreign, almost like a fairy tale. But the part where suffering finds us in seemingly arbitrary ways John's place in the story? That one we know. That one doesn't feel so foreign. Because we do, now, live in a world where the good guy doesn't always win. Where the best people we know sometimes get the worst medical results. Where the gentlest people sometimes meet very violent ends where the wicked seem to flourish while the righteous go without, where the outwardly beautiful are celebrated while the inwardly beautiful often go unnoticed. And sometimes it always feels like, sometimes it all just feels like this strange game of chance. It feels random, arbitrary. We, or those we love, seek to build something good and suddenly it's in ruins and we don't know what happened. And most of us, maybe all of us, have known those ruins. The ruins that are left behind after the thing we built is leveled. 
the plans we had now feel destroyed. And we stand amongst the rubble and we say, I did not see this coming. I didn't think this would happen. And if our Bible ended here, if Mark 6 was the end of the story, that would be the takeaway indeed. But the takeaway here is that even great Bible heroes have known ruins. Even this young movement to follow Jesus knew those moments, those ruins. And so we are not alone in that. But the takeaway is that the story did not end here. Oh, John is beheaded. Yes, there's no way around that. But all the work that John had done to this point, well, there's story still left to tell there. Ten more chapters of Mark's Gospel account. A whole ministry of Jesus, a cross, even more devastating to the reader than John's beheading. And then a resurrection. And then Acts. And Paul's mission to the Gentiles. And Gentile conversions. And thousands of years of the church and the world getting it right sometimes. And getting it wrong sometimes, and still ministering, and eventually John's vision of where it all goes, and the risen Christ on a throne, and there's so much story left to be told, even in John the Baptist's ruins. So much story left to go. These ruins, John's beheading, the ruins that we find ourselves in. The message here is that there's a glory in them. There's a God with a plan to redeem those ruins, to build again, to bring back to life. These are glorious ruins, as we will sing in just a moment. A glory built them, and when life and its sometimes arbitrary nature brings it down, there is still a glory resting in them, and a glory yet to come. For all of John the Baptist's greatness, it was the one who was greater, the one who would come after, that would be the glory of it all. And he is the God we serve. A God who can take the ruins of this life and make of them glory. A God who can resurrect this rubble, put stone upon stone, and make of it a kingdom. So if you've known these times in your life, you'll know the truth of what I'm speaking today. If you find yourself there now, or you find yourself in those ruins sometime in the future, take care to remember our brother John the Baptist and the glory that would come out of the ruins that he knew. May the God of glory continue to make of our stories glorious ruins. Amen. Oh,
story with you uh, without sharing specifics, but we received a letter uh, as a church uh, just a few weeks ago, and uh, it was a letter to our session of someone who lived states away, hours and hours away, um, but had been worshiping with us virtually for some time now. And uh, the note was very kind and very encouraging of the ministry of this church, and it included a check, um, a little offering to our church. And I was incredibly grateful to receive it. Um, and I know our session is as well. And that's just one example of how so many of you are helping us continue the ministry that we are doing around here. But more than that, um, every little bit of offering is also an encouragement to so many folks that have worked so hard through this whole pandemic uh, to keep our community going, to keep it united, to keep us together, even though we've been apart, to continue our worship each week, every Lord's Day, come what may. So uh, you know who you are that sent the gift, and we're thankful for it. And I would encourage you, if you've been 
worshiping with us to uh, consider supporting the ministry of the church goes to good cause and is certainly an encouragement to our church community. Thank you all, and may God bless the offering taken up this morning. And now let us pray with one another. Lord, our rock and redeemer, we thank you that you are great and abundant in power. Your strength is beyond measure. The Bible says that you are able to bless us abundantly so that in all things, at all times, you will supply what we need, that we may abound in every good work. Give us the strength we need today, Lord. May we thrive in the power of your Spirit. May your love be the passion in our hearts. May your joy be our strength when times are hard. May your presence be our peace that passes all understanding. Gracious Father, please fill us with your Holy Spirit to lead us. You said that your Spirit will teach us all things and guide us into all truth. We ask you for guidance and direction now, Lord, and pray that you would answer our request. You are a good Father to your children. When we become overwhelmed, please give us a trust and hope that overflows. Clear our minds to follow you with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So thankful for the rich tradition of prayer that uh, runs through all denominations. Uh, our prayers this morning, our pastoral prayers, were guided by brothers and sisters from our Catholic tradition. And so, so thankful uh, for, for the rich prayers that we've been handed down. As we go to conclude our worship, we speak of leaning on the everlasting arms of our God. Let's sing together. Yeah. 
strange text for this morning, but a clear call that even from the ruins, our God can resurrect, bring something new, send us out to keep building a kingdom. Even from amidst our own rubble, even from amidst the rubble of a community, God has something to do with us. God is with us. God has a plan for us. So my prayer is that you would trust that this week and continue to do God's work in the world. Know that as you do, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit goes with you this day and every day. Amen.